Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Do Americans believe that their country is in the middle of a cold civil war? Let's get to the bottom line. For years, more and more Americans have been losing trust in their journalists and their politicians. January 6th will go down in history as one of the days when mistrust spilled over into violent mayhem. Citizens following Donald Trump's dark vision of American carnage actually attacked the American Capitol. People died. It made Americans wonder how fragile their democracy is for the first time in a long time. Add COVID to that equation, joblessness, economic anxiety, inequality, structural racism. Now all sides are angry and doubt each other, doubt political leaders, they doubt the media, and they doubt their social institutions. For many, trust has been supplanted by anger, fear, and wild conspiracy theories trying to make sense of it all. And by the way, these tensions erupting in a deeply divided America aren't just happening here. You can see trust eroding inside many other countries all over the world. Today, we're talking to Richard Edelman, whose global public relations firm publishes an annual survey of attitudes in 27 countries called the Edelman Trust Barometer. The latest poll has just now been released. Richard, great to see you, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Listen, I have to start with the incidents we've seen this past week of a deeply divided America and assault on the Capitol. I can't think of a better time when uh, than now to look at the question of trust in this country. Your report is one of my favorites uh, to look at each year. What are the highlights of your report and what do they say about this unusual and awful moment we're in? Well, um, we have a uh, real infodemic, Steve. Um, we've got uh, the fact that people don't believe the leaders anymore. 60% of our respondents said they think leaders uh, intentionally lie to them. Uh, and they don't believe the uh, platforms either. Uh, trust in mainstream media has gone down by 12 points this year. Trust in social media is at all time low, around 30%. And so um, they're just operating with an absence of facts. And therefore they go on hopes or illusions. And I think that's really the basis on which um, those hooligans invaded the uh, Capitol last week. Just the false hope that they could overturn the Electoral College, which was not gonna happen and it was a violation of American democracy. I just got a, a press release from Senator Chris Coons, Richard, and that press release headline is um, that we have two pandemics, that we've got a health pandemic in COVID, and we have a pandemic of division and distrust. It sounds like he got an early copy of this report, huh. or is he just okay. reflecting these times? We have an inextricable linkage, Steve, between the pandemic and um, disinformation. Think about the reality that, uh, you know, only two thirds of Americans are prepared to get vaccinated. That's really on the basis of misinformation, uh, a, a sort of history maybe of bad uh, treatment of African-Americans in particular, Tuskegee, et cetera, but also the uh, sad fact that um, people are going on um, rumor and not on, not on fact. And, and that's a tragedy in a democracy. We've got to get good information in front of people so they can make uh, legitimate decisions. Well, you mentioned that two thirds of the public will be willing to take uh, the, the vaccine, but actually I looked at your numbers and it says that 33% are willing to take it in the near term and 31 more percent maybe within the first year, which gets you to two thirds, but that doesn't sound like a very enthusiastic population to get vaccinated. But Steve, here's the thing. We also find that people with poor information hygiene, so those who just get information from social um, and share it and just go on single source are substantially less willing to get vaccinated. So we've got, as Senator Kuhn said, a, it's almost like a DNA strand with the pandemic and infodemic uh, inextricably linked. You know, I talked to you six months ago when you did a midterm uh, version of this report, and it was shocking because in that report, you saw trust in government institutions, trust in scientists, trust in intellectual authorities, if you will, really go through the roof. And it looked at a time when, you know, when there was this, you know, health pandemic hitting uh, Americans and creating fear that they were looking at. But then you look at this study here and you see that those institutions, trust in them has collapsed. What happened? So, so Steve, last year in Davos, when we talked, um, business was tied with NGOs as the most trusted institution. Then came COVID 
And it was like a wartime situation and people put their trust into government and scientists. And then that's collapsed. As an A-frame house, this is the back end. And uh, so trust has cratered for government and business has stayed quite stable. So business is now the most trusted institution. And there are all sorts of new expectations of the private sector. Um, for example, you know, it's up to the tech companies to take uh, certain people off of their platforms. Uh, it's up to um, the uh, private sector also to, uh, you know, somehow fix um, the, the, the food supply or, or any of these things. And, and so government is 50 points less competent than business in this study. That's a stunning condemnation of government's handling of the pandemic in particular. Are we in a good situation? And I would even ask you, Richard, are businesses in a good situation with so many people looking to large corporations to bail them out? You know, I can tell you just to you know put a uh, you know a date tag on this. You know, Angela Merkel has come out uh, come out and throttled Twitter for banning uh, Donald Trump. A lot of Americans think it was great to ban Donald Trump. You know, Amazon Web, Web Services kicking Parler off. That we look to be in a situation where that line of where trust and responsibility should be with the social contract that companies have with Americans or Americans have that they have with citizens all around the world is in debate right now. And so as they look at companies for responsible action, are companies prepared to really be responsible? So Steve, I look at this on a sort of spectrum of action. So in the sort of obvious you have to do, you have to speak up to your employees about uh, diversity and inclusion. You have to condemn systemic racism. You have to um, be sure to say that the murder of George Floyd was an unforgivable act. Um, that's because it's relevant to your employees and, and, and to your business. Um, now, the decisions to remove um, your political donations to certain parties or to certain people, that's further on the spectrum. That's a more ambitious, aggressive. And by the way, I agree with it. Um, Edelman's not gonna make any donations to Ted Cruz or to anybody who voted uh, to overturn the electoral college uh, procedure. Now. Further on the spectrum is the decision to take off um, certain individuals, politicians from, from social platforms, uh, or to take Parler off of, uh, of, 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 of Apple or any other store. So again, I think over time, business is gonna be in a better place if it works cooperatively with government on these kinds of decisions. There are those that are in the wheelhouse, and then there are those that are at the edge. And um, if it's a, playing field issue where, you know, I think business, if it's a player and a referee is going to have trouble. Um, you got to leave it to business to be the actor and let government be the referee. One of the things that really fascinated me about your reports, and you always do actually, are, is the global dimension of them. You were in a lot of countries, I think 27 different countries, if I'm not mistaken, uh, did a poll of public attitudes in them and looked at their tr trust levels across the board. And you found higher degrees of trust in places like China and India by far than in the United States. And the United States, while never rock bottom, was pretty close to the bottom in many of the measures. But you had some surprising countries like Indonesia and India way on top. What are they getting right? What's China getting right that the United States is not? So in general, Steve, and this has been a, a, a sort of progression over a decade, countries in Asia have populations that have more trust in their institutions. They tend to be performing better economically. Uh, the rising tide is lifting all ships. Um, I do wanna point out, however, in the last six months, trust in China has gone down more 18 points than in any other country, uh, and particularly trust in business, down 25 points. It's a big warning for American companies operating in China, be careful. Um, also, I would say that trust in China as a foreign government uh, is at 30%, so an all-time low, um, again, based on perhaps keeping the truth from the world about uh, COVID. Meanwhile, trust in the United States is only 40%, an all-time low. Um, again, we're not exactly seen as helping on sustainability or um, you know, being a good, good partner with a lot of these countries. So we got a lot of work to do for America in terms of international relations. One of the uh, other elements that I, I gravitated towards in your in your uh, report were the very different attitudes that Republicans and Democrats have regarding trust in media. 
Um, yeah. I think Democrats were around 57 percent. Republicans were around 18 percent, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. in that, you talk about, uh, you know, I think in, in information hygiene and, and the way people interact with their news sources. Can you can you break that down for us? Sure. So uh, what's happened since the election is that uh, trust among Trump voters has uh, plummeted. Uh, in fact, it's gone down 15 points, most in, in, in media, somewhat in government and, and NGOs, not so much in business. And I think the media is seen, particularly by Trump voters, as biased, politicized, um, not telling um, the full truth. And so it's sort of written off. And I think the media has a job to do. You're a you know forever top journalist. Um, is seen as having moved towards opinion away from fact and towards following tweets and, and being a reporter on that which the legislators say as opposed to doing independent reporting. And I think we have to get back to a time when media is seen as the bulwark of society. And at the moment, it's seen as actually feeding division. And that's a very, very poor place for a democracy to be. Do you think there's a pathway back on that? Because, you know, as I look at, you know, the many different platforms and, I'll, I, you know, I just joined Parler, for instance, the other day on the day that they unplugged it because I, I really didn't know very much about it. Didn't know about Twitter, do know a lot about TikTok, um, you know, and, and Instagram and other places. But, it, you know, a very, very different arena of, of news. You know, 10 years ago, we were talking about blogging. We've, you know, gone a very uh, long way in in different directions and fragmenting that media. I guess the question I have is, how can we make all of these platforms at least aspire to more responsible engagement with the truth? How do we get people to reward and punish those media outlets for engaging with the truth? So Steve, I think that the media is always gonna be the core of people's knowledge base, but the surround sound can be provided by NGOs, by business and by government uh, when they have comparable advantage in a specific issue area. And so I found it amazing that in our study, employer media is actually more credible than mainstream media. That tells me that trust is actually local. Trust is in my, trust is in, in, in you know, my employer CEO. So again, all the employees of that company, all the people who are, are in the community where the company's headquartered have the ability to be informed uh, at least um, on the basis of what the company's view is. And I think that's a helpful addition to overall knowledge. We have to be sure that social media doesn't continue to be a sewer. It has to not just be this idea of free speech. Free speech, Oliver Wendell Holmes was very direct about this. Fire in a crowded theater, not okay. There is a limit to speech and we have reached that limit now. And so companies, NGOs, others have to intervene by putting up quality material in the social feed so people can get educated. One of the interesting points of convergence what you just spoke to is the is the CEO employer that 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 person being uh, interviewed CEO. There's this very high level of trust and the high level of trust, whether one is a Republican or Democrat, it's it's really the only space in your report that I can see both Trump supporters and Biden supporters kind of roughly in the same uh, uh, spot in terms of trusting their employer. I guess my question, because I've talked to you before, what is the playbook then for that employer? What is the playbook for that company that actually has an opportunity to talk to both sides of the equation? What do they need to do to be transformative. And, and I, let me just go one more step. What do they need to do to guide government and NGO? I mean, you're not just about businesses and government. There are other players out there uh, whose, whose trust has plummeted. Uh, and I guess my, my question is, what can those CEOs do to create a, a healthier ecosystem? Because they may be the only ones that these people are listening to. So let's use Massachusetts as an example. There's, uh, there's a group of 20 companies uh, that have come together called the Massachusetts Competitive Alliance. And they're dealing with education, infrastructure, health, et cetera. And they're inviting in PE firms like Bain. Uh, they're they're you know, inviting the big employers in, in, in the area. And they are speaking to government and then acting on their own. So they are taking on job upskilling. They are taking on the, the, you know, we're getting more diverse senior management or diverse board or like this. Um, 
small business in the supply chain. So they have specific agenda items. They are bringing this to the governor and to the mayor in Boston and saying, we're gonna get this done. Now let's do it together. That's a productive way to proceed between business and government. One of the things um, that has been bothering me in the COVID story of this is the communications plan. I was like asking myself, you know, is, is uh, uh, Tony Fauci calling Richard Edelman? Is Donald Trump calling Richard Edelman? Is someone calling Richard Edelman on what the communications plan is for a vaccine rollout? When I go and talk to communities around the United States, which I do, there's incredible confusion about vaccines. People don't know what order they should be in. There's fear about uh, folks that have gotten sick uh, uh, potentially from having been vaccinated. And you have lots of communities, communities of color and others that have been hit hard by this vaccine without, as best I can tell, ambassadors uh, that they might trust going out to them. Are you as appalled as I am? Uh, because I've been asking government officials, and they say, don't worry, we have a plan. But are you as appalled as I am that there seems to be no apparent communications plan with the vaccine uh, nation strategy for uh, COVID? So, <sighs> We're working with the city of Chicago on a, on a program. Um, I think it can't just come from top down from the uh, director of, of public health or whatever. That's important, but not sufficient. We have such a lot of sort of uh, suspicion, rumor, et cetera. We've got to brief um, church leaders and community activists and others with quality information such that they can talk to the congregants and give them reassurance about the way in which the clinical trials were carried out, who was in the trials, what the side effects might be, like anaphylactic res response or something, and, and what a small percentage that is, and that it's recoupable, et cetera. And the, in fact, the speed with which these vaccines were developed is not miraculous. It was actually on the basis of all these companies working together and sharing knowledge. So um, we've got to do our basic part of communications before someone's gonna to agree to get vaccinated. And Steve, it's the most important thing we have in the next three months is to get this vaccination program accepted. I mean, I, I agree with you, and I guess it does need to come from the bottom up, it, you know, at some level. But it, it just seemed after we've been talking about this for a year, we've been talking about the Native American population, which we now see reports of so many elders dying there, the black yeah. population, the Hispanic population taking such a large brunt that when you look at this and, and uh, you know, I can just tell you about where I live out in rural Maryland, even frontline uh, police officers and fire uh, uh, responders, you know, a little bit less than one third are getting vaccinated, even though they're in the front of the line. So it fits very much with your data. Maybe they'll, you know, another third in over the year, but it's just very clear that that communication strategy is not there. Um, but Steve, the one I, thing I, that we I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it. I'm desperately worried about it, and I'm also worried that business is going to overreach and do something like mandate um, a uh, vaccine for employees. And I think that's exactly the wrong message because it means, oh, well, um, they couldn't persuade me, so they're having to force me. And then that's going to create a whole ripple effect of, of further mistrust. Uh, and we should at least do the best we can to put the data in front of people and try to get them to comply as opposed to the stick. One of, one of the things that we talked about, um, about companies and their behavior in the past, that a lot of companies, you know, went through a, you know, check off the box, you know, make sure you're sustainable, make sure that you talk about, you know, equity and women's pay, you know, check boxes off. And you said that's no longer good enough, that they had to get into the game, that they had to help solve problems. Do you stand by that? And let me just ask you, if you were advising politicians who were a big part of this study and, and you know, trust in politicians is just simply plummeted to the, you know, dark caves of the earth, uh, what do they need to do? Would you give them the same advice? Stop posturing and solve. I think it's all about uh, action. People want results and politicians have to take the political hat off and put on the uh, competence hat and be very practical and um, be willing to partner with other institutions, business, et cetera, and not look for immediate glory. And it's not about the, the latest uh, sort of stand up uh, press conference or whatever. It's just get the hard work done. And um, the idea somehow that um, 
we've gone to our own corners in politics also opens up this whole avenue for business in a certain way to be the web of, 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 of kind of bringing us back together. Just again, because business will get stuff done and we'll, we'll get back to work. We will have a, for example, a health safety passport is something that I've been pushing for months. And, you know, Steve Clemens wants to fly to London in order to do his job here. He should be able to do that. And we should know that you've had the vaccine or that you've had the disease or that you've, you know, been, been tested at the following places for how long. I mean, everyone deserves that level of comfort. And you need to know also that the restaurants and that the, you know, people on the airplanes are, who are sitting next to you have done the same thing. You know, we're in a community where the, the, the least common denominator can make you sick. So you have to guarantee against that. I've often talked to you about this report for many years now in the middle of some of the most powerful people in the world in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. There are also NGO heads, there are social leaders and communities from all over the world, business people too, uh, of every part of the world. When I read this report this year, it's among the bleakest that I have read. When we talk about a cold civil war and you look at the collapse of deficit, it's not a pretty picture. But give us your pathway, if you will, uh, as if we were talking to those NGO leaders around the world, we were talking about the problems of the world. What is the way to a less bleak uh, and a more hopeful situation, if you can, um, than the realities you're describing in this year's trust barometer? So, Steve, I actually think that we've probably hit a trust bottom and that um, the way forward is action, transparency, frequency of communication, Fairness, we haven't talked enough about this, the, the, the biggest mass class divide in terms of opinion in the history of the trust barometer. Of our mm -hmm. 27 countries, 24 have double digit trust divides between the elites and the mass. Dow Jones, 30,000, record unemployment levels and, 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 and a lot of sickness among uh, people who are frontline workers. So, you know, we have to have four or five things that we are going to accomplish in the next 12 months. and. If, if those are done, then we will see a significant rise in trust. It's almost like, you know, you and I are desperate to get back on the road because we're road warriors. This is how we've lived our whole lives. And we want to be safe and we want to get back in the game. But, you know, imagine, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a restaurant worker and your place is closed because the, the boss can't make enough money just having seats outdoors. And so everybody wants to go out. Everybody wants to go back to their old lives. And so... We just need to make that easier. We need to hurry up and, and get it done. And there needs to be seen to be, again, fairness. That's the word. Um, we can't have the wealthy being so rich and, and all this. Everybody thinks the game's rigged. And that's the thing that Trump plays into, this whole you know idea of being rigged. And, and I don't know, that's not America that I know. Um, but. If people, Steve, if people are afraid, they are unable to function normally. And, and the fears are particularly around job loss and downward economic mobility. And we have to be empathetic about that. And we have to show, we are gonna invest money in training you so that you have a chance. If you, if you bust your ass, we're gonna take care of you because you're gonna be trained and can compete. As opposed to, oh, 25% of the retail jobs are going to disappear this year because 25,000 stores are going to are going to go bye bye. And how many branch banks are going to go bye bye? You know, particularly women are very vulnerable right now to uh, job loss, um, clerical, etc. Um, and and they don't want to have a diminution of income like that, so they're mad. So give them a path forward. Show them that community colleges are going to be improved. Show them that the companies are going to pay for their scholarships to those schools. That's a big deal. That's, that's being fair to people. Well, Richard, I want to thank you again for your candor today and talking to us, as you have done so many times, about uh, technology and you know the anxieties it creates, as well as the opportunities and how uh, people who are feeling left behind uh, or not part of the system need to be brought into the system. I really appreciate your candor, Richard, and the publication of the Edelman Trust Barometer. So Richard Edelman of Edelman PR, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. So what's the bottom line? Social trust is what makes communities work. Without it, people can't agree on the rules and anarchy and fear just take over. We need to trust that people are gonna stop at a red light, that our medicines are safe and that our restaurants are clean, that our leaders don't lie. Otherwise, society breaks down and fear just takes over. 
In the United States, trust between the supporters of the two opposing visions for America has reached a low point. It can be rebuilt. But can the Democrats and the Republicans be less about winner takes all and more about we're all in the same boat? So far, I'm sorry, it doesn't look promising. But January 6th might just be the spark that starts the conversation. And that's the bottom line. Thank you.